Hi, I'm Wap Kanu. I'm Anishinaabe from the Ojibwe's of Enigaming First Nation in Ontario. Welcome to Eight Fire. It's been about 500 years since your people first met my people. And things look a little bit different. Let's face it though, our relationship still needs a lot of work. Some people call it reconciliation. Some people call it the Eight Fire, a First Nations prophecy that says that now is the time for all people to come together and build a new relationship. If not, things could get a little awkward. After all, Aboriginal peoples are Canada's fastest growing population and more than half of us now live in the cities. So come meet the neighbours. And I promise, honest engine, no guilt trips. Maybe even a few surprises. We're kind of invisible almost. The only time when we're really notice is when something's going wrong. Death rate, poverty and alcoholism. I don't see myself as an Aboriginal being any of those statistics. When I hear from other Canadians that we as Aboriginal people should just get over it, I often think that they probably haven't heard enough. The biggest opportunity right now is young people in the city. Nobody's gonna go nowhere. Everybody's here to stay. Now how do we work it out together? It's true. We're not all hidden away on reserves anymore. Here in Winnipeg, one in 10 people is either First Nation, Inuit, or Métis. That's the largest Aboriginal population per capita of any Canadian city. But how do we form a new relationship if we don't know each other? Almost half of urban Canadians say that they have little or no contact with Aboriginal peoples. And when they do, it's often negative. Yet, if you look past the streets, you'll find the cities are buzzing with our culture, creativity, and energy. What stereotypes do you have as a Canadian about Indigenous people? I really, really ask you to examine those stereotypes that you carry. You may not have ever met an Indigenous person in Canada before, and I, I meet many people who haven't, but they do know our stereotypes. The biggest stereotypes? You meet people and say, well, you're not native, are you? You're still native in Canada? Non-educated. Alcoholics and drug addicts. Lazy. Very negative, very put down. Taxes, that's a big one. I'm sorry, I pay a lot of taxes. Wow, and that's just for starters. But we all know that those are just comic book caricatures. I tell people I'm an Aboriginal artist. They're like, oh, so you carve totem poles? And I'm like, no. Oh, so you paint buffaloes? No, I draw comic books. It's like, it needs to draw comic books? And I was like, yes, yeah, it's, it's not an, a ridiculous notion to think that, you know. Steve Sanderson, who is a Plains Cree from Saskatchewan, isn't drawing buffaloes. But he has drawn for a popular animated series in the States and worked on computer games. His early influences were big. Growing up was the Incredible Hulk. I was just fascinated with the Hulk. I mean, there was just so, there was a million photos of me growing up um, wearing my Incredible Hulk swim trunks or my Incredible Hulk t-shirt, you know, like I was just fascinated by the Incredible Hulk. Okay, you can see his superhero influences, but these days he's drawn to telling stories that affect Aboriginal kids in Canada, like suicide, adoption, diabetes, and the different ways stereotypes work. The most classic idea of, of, of a positive stereotype of Aboriginal people is that noble savage, you know, the really cool, really handsome, you know, rugged Indian. And as much as it is appealing, it is limiting. Because it's an idea that keeps us stuck in a certain time. We're no more or no less than that. And it's from 200 years ago. Meanwhile, me, I, you know, work on a computer. I'm doing comic books 100% digital, you know what I'm saying? Like, I'm, I'm not using Flint here, you know? 
in the modern metropolis of Toronto. A managing partner in a law firm finds it's not that she's a woman, but that she is malice that surprises people. I have tended to notice that when I first identify as an Aboriginal person and then um, someone finds out that I'm also a lawyer, I tend to get a very strong reaction. Uh, people are very impressed and like, oh, wow, that's amazing and good for you. And I can't help but feel like if they just thought I was a white person, that it wouldn't be that big of a deal. More of us are joining the middle class, even though a lot of people think we're all poor and living on the street and think young. Half of Aboriginal people living in the cities are under 25, the fastest growing population in Canada. They could be the future workforce. Problem is, too many Canadians think they're all gang members. Let's get it cracking! Let's check out the story of some young guys that seem to fit that stereotype. Gangsters, rappers, three guys. Let's go! John C., Brooklyn, and Charlie Feta. They call themselves Winnipeg's most. In a few short years, they've gained a lot of attention. It's crazy when you get a kid singing our stuff. It's like, I think that means more than the money to me. It's like, you know, I'm actually changing the way people think and changing the way, you know, and hitting people's hearts. It was John C. and Feta who first met and started making music together. Brooklyn joined them a year later and recorded an album that took off. Now they're winning awards. Had a spread in McLean's magazine. They even opened their own store. We got the gear. We're going to get into our own jeans, all sorts of stuff. And are swarmed by fans. We were stopped at Calgary to hop on the next plane, and uh, two middle-aged white men, like, in their, like, I would say early 50s, like, look at me and John C. and says, are you the most? It's like, my kids love you. He's like, I need a picture right now. Pull this aside, took a picture of me, and Billy were like, this is crazy. Between these guys, race isn't a factor. Grade six, I started playing guitar. I started being into hip-hop. Charlie Feta isn't even Aboriginal. Yeah, Feta is like pink. He's he's not even white. He's pink. <laughs> Our relationship, it's like we said, we've never tried to ever be racist or ever, you know, look at that sort of aspect. I'm with two Aboriginal guys. I know both their families. Their families treat me the same way, so it's I, like I, I, I'm really colorblind when it comes to things like that. You see it, but I don't. Brooklyn, who is Métis, and John C., whose mother is Anishinaabe from Saguin First Nation, grew up in the inner city. Like one out of three Aboriginal kids, they didn't finish high school. The north end of Winnipeg is basically uh, the lower end of Winnipeg. There's a lot of space for underachievers, so to speak. Some in the community say it's more than just underachievement. They say it's not that Aboriginal kids are dropping out of school, rather that they are being pushed out because they don't feel included. If our kids continue to be taunted on the playing fields and pushed out of schools and experience racism and all kinds of other things, they're not going to think that they deserve better, and they're not going to trust that they can go to a certain program or go to a certain place and make positive changes in their lives because of what other people are still imposing upon them. Let's just say you're a normal person. Race isn't in a factor, sex isn't in a factor, looks aren't even in a factor. And you've just grown up in a negative environment. Everybody tells you you're stupid. Everyone tells you you're nothing. Everyone looks at you. Even if they don't even say anything, they just give you that look. I don't think you're going to behave to your full potential. Aboriginal kids are five times more likely than non-Aboriginal kids to be in trouble with the law. Yeah. And let's come clean on Winnipeg's most. 
They wrestle with demons of a recent past. Feta and Brooklyn spent time in prison. I was a horrible guy back then. I just had no emotion, no nothing. I was a monster. It's estimated Aboriginal gangs could double in membership in the next 10 years. So why do a higher percentage of our kids join gangs? Well, it's partly because of racism and the effects of colonization. And Aboriginal kids are twice as likely as non-Aboriginal kids to live below the poverty line. I grew up where it was hard. Every turn was never easy for me. I went out and I did certain things to get myself nice clothes, you know what I mean? I clothed myself. There's a lot of influences out there. And, and, and when I was young, the influences out there was crime. It wasn't music, it wasn't this, it was crime. You've seen your mom get beat up your whole life and seen your dad sell drugs and all that, you're probably going to do the same thing. If I didn't find music when I did, I'd be those two options, dead or in jail for life. Indigenous youth uh, are caught between two worlds and they're suffering the results of this alienation and this ignorance and all of the kinds of violences and abuses and pathologies and diseases and all these things that are happening to a much higher degree to our youth than in a, to other people. So what is it that was lost that leaves Aboriginal peoples caught between two worlds, that leaves more in poverty, out of school, and in trouble with the law. The source can be directly traced to our colonial history. Way back in 1876, the new government of Canada passed the Indian Act, which made Indians wards of the crown. The Indian Act controlled our lives. We were forbidden to practice our traditions or speak our language. Our ceremonial items were collected and burned. We weren't allowed to leave the reserve without a pass, and we couldn't go to university unless we gave up our Indian status. Indians were forced from their land and given tiny little spaces called reserves, which were controlled by government agents. We were supposed to live out of the way of the settlers who took our land. This country is founded on, I think Daniel Francis write, writes about it, but it's founded on the negation of Aboriginal people to justify the theft. <laughs> you know, that's just, you know, someone comes into your house and you welcome them and then they, pretty soon they take over your house. You have to have a reason for it. Well, it's because they're not really human. And because we were cleared away from cities, most people don't even know whose land their suburban dream home has been built on. You're driving around, you're walking around, you're like, well, these people have a nice life here. It'd be nice if they acknowledged that they're on our territory, much less give it back. But, you know, that ain't gonna happen tomorrow. But at least they could acknowledge it and not just try to wipe us out psychologically and say that we're just like everybody else. Much of the reserve land we were stuck with was not exactly prime land. You couldn't really make a living from it. So some people started to move out of reserves, seeking a better life in the cities, but were treated like strangers on their own land. So people were just like, OK, we have Native people, we have Indian people. They come out of the bush, they dress funny, they look funny, they smell funny. But then it's OK, because they come in and they go back in the bush. But more and more in the 70s, Native people started to come in the city, in town, but settle in town. So now it was starting to be a little bit more awkward for the non-Native population. So leaving the community for many is leaving behind struggles and problems and difficulties and crises. Thinking that the city is the El Dorado of a new life, but more than often, you find yourself isolated, you find yourself alone, and you find yourself marginalized.
what do Elton John and Belinda Stronach have in common? Well, they both own paintings by Cree artist Kent Monkman. His work can sell for $150,000. Monkman questions the colonizers' view of history and their view of where Indians belong in the world. Why are Aboriginal people living in the cities? And then I started thinking, well, why are people living on reserves? Reserves are, in many places, arbitrary, artificial places that were established by the Canadian government. I think there's a perception that Aboriginal people all come from a reserve. Well, I don't know if anyone in my family actually lived on that reserve. If they did, it wasn't for very long, um, because it wasn't really a place where we um, wanted to call home. I think a lot of Aboriginal people at some point, you know, want to live in the cities, and I think um, that was certainly the case in my family. It was a very deliberate choice to create opportunities for us to get a good education, to have opportunities to get music lessons and go to the art galleries and basically participate in the world. And boy, does Kent participate. He's a multimedia artist who is breaking stereotypes and tearing down boundaries with his videos and paintings of his alter ego, Miss Chief Eagle Testicle. His subversive work is shaking up the relationship with the colonizers from Montreal to Paris. One of the main themes that I deal with in my work is uh, sexuality and colonized sexuality. Coming out as a gay man and, you know, realizing that in our own cultures, uh, we had an openness to diverse sexuality that somehow got stamped out by the Europeans who didn't understand it. With Miss Chief as the subject, Kent's art appropriates the work of 19th century artists like George Catlin, who idealized Native Americans in his paintings. Kent stands those romanticized ideas on their head. So I created Miss Chief, so she's really, you know, this flamboyant, kind of egomaniac artist who's in all of her own paintings. She's kind of reversing the gaze, where it's the Aboriginal artist who's looking at the Europeans. I'm dealing with an art history, uh, a tradition of making art in North America that really was about obliterating Aboriginal narratives. There was such a strong will to disappear us, to disappear us from the places where we lived, the places where we were born. Our present is informed by our histories, and we have to engage with these histories to understand why we are where we are right now. That I thought about it one day, and I realized, OK, so my father went to residential school. His father went to residential school. His father didn't go to residential school because he was still an Indian that was like living off the land that wasn't starting to get grouped up at the time that reservations were being made. My great great grandfather was a full on buffalo hunting Indian. You know what I'm saying? That's only four generations. That is not a lot of time. Residential schools that screwed up government idea to take children away from their families in order to kill the Indian in the child. That attempt to assimilate us by destroying our languages and cultures didn't work. But by the time the last school closed in 1996, it did manage to devastate our families. I think the state has done a lot to make sure that we implode. And uh, all the forces that were set to work, residential school was one of them, but there were a lot of different ways of ensuring that we didn't come out of this unscathed. Then they could say, well, look, they're all drunk. Once you sanction uh, theft, once you sanction the alienation of an entire people, once you illegalize and render illegitimate everything about it, once you uh, paint the face of the person with uh, negative stereotypes and you say that that's okay, once you've done that, everything else becomes 
that you do that's destructive becomes okay. And so the, the social pathology, as they say, are gonna, it's gonna keep getting worse uh, because Native people see a vision of Canada which they just cannot accommodate. The effect is huge. The tsunami of generational effects are occurring now. And my mother certainly never talked about it. If we tried to raise it with her, she would get extremely angry. As a result of her own mother's experience attending residential school, Leslie Varley has dedicated her life to breaking down barriers that prevent Aboriginal peoples from accessing good health care. That way, they can heal from the trauma. There's a lot of internalized oppression in Aboriginal people, and that's part of the challenge, having to heal ourselves. I don't think I would do this, you know, if we were all a really healthy Aboriginal community and we were all thriving and, you know, I, I wouldn't be doing this. I'd be a gardener. <laughs> The land that our school is located on right here, this is traditional Anishinaabe homeland. The education of Canadians, I think, is by far the most important thing. They really need to know and understand what we've been through. And then they need to engage with us about what we need to do to make things better for ourselves. The irony of this all is that it's far more expensive to keep us contained in the downtown east side of Vancouver than it is to work with us to become integrated into Canadian society. The largest concentration of homeless Aboriginal people in Canada live in Vancouver's downtown east side. Leslie's brother is one of them. We're just uh, lazy, you know, good for nothing downtown east siders. You kind of get thick skin after a while, you just ignore it. Herb Dixon worked most of his life on fishing boats around the world. But when the work dried up, he returned to Vancouver and couldn't find a job. As I said, it's not the Taj Mahal, but it's, it's a roof over my head for now. Like his father before him, he fell into a world of alcohol and drug addiction. I got tied up in my addictions and I lost it. You know, it's my own fault. I don't blame anybody for it except myself. One of the things I know about my brother is that he's always making a plan to get out of there, to get a job, to find somewhere else to live, got to get out of here. Once you're there, it's very difficult to pull yourself out of the downtown east side. People in inner cities who are caught in this web are not only there because of their own failings. They are partly there because of failings of society. Schools have failed to um, give them good educational attainment. There's not enough opportunity for them to integrate into the workforce. There isn't necessarily always safe housing and real estate that can support them. I just let him live his life. I know he's had issues with addiction to uh, crack cocaine, and um, I don't like it, but there's really nothing I can do with that. But just be there for him when he reaches out to me. Herb Varley is also struggling in the downtown east side. He's trying hard to stay out of the life his father has fallen into. He's taking advantage of programs at the Urban Native Youth Association, a place that gives him new skills and training to become part of a community. You know, it's, it's just fantastic. And you see how much, if you have meaningful opportunities and uh, culturally relevant programming and people who are just willing to listen, what kind of a difference it can make in the life of a young person. So Herb is a walking example of, you know, how much people can change. He has branched out into photography, and this is opening night at a local art gallery, where his exhibit deals with the time he was briefly homeless. One of the things we came to realize in this project is many people that are homeless are struggling with addiction issues. But he's no longer sleeping in doorways. This is where I live now. It's just a room, and this is 12 by 14. A jail cell is 12 by 8. He invited his father to come tonight. Yeah, he's going to be here soon. Um, 
I don't think he's actually ever really attended any of too many of my shows. But you know, tonight's a start. His auntie Leslie showed up, and he still holds hope for his father. But at the end of the night, he's a no-show. He wasn't really there when I was growing up, and um, I don't have any resentment towards that because he had—he was living his own life. He was going through his own struggles for that entire time. That residential school was in effect. Our families were destroyed. And now we're really only relearning again how to be families without, without constant fighting, without constant bickering. Because we're, we're just not used to it anymore because our families were broken up. I think what people need to realize is that things can change so quickly. I had such challenges growing up in, in my life, you know, all kinds of things, alcoholism and single parent and living in the projects and my mother passed early. But when I look at my children, my daughter is a PhD student, my son is an established artist. So it gives me great hope for the future to see how much things can change within one generation. Here in Winnipeg, Brooklyn is in his neighborhood bar. This is familiar territory. All these people we know in some way. A refuge from the stresses of his music career. This is where he grew up. Dar mayor as she got murdered. Jungle out here. As a kid, Brooklyn already was a budding rapper. And he was a star athlete on a championship baseball team at his local community center. Yeah, this used to be my rec center. But he says things changed when they tore it down. There's nothing in this area. It's, they're just pretty much forcing kids back into the streets. He's recognized as a celebrity and hero. But also for his criminal past. It continually comes back to haunt him. In general, look, there's the bad guys right there, eh? Just watching. Watch, they'll come mess with us. They'll come mess with us for sure. What's your name, too? Prefontaine. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you've met me. As far as that goes, same old. It's never going to change. Never, no matter how good we do. Brooklyn's friend Brett is arrested on an outstanding warrant. That's not how you do That's all I do. That's all I do. He will be released two hours later. You guys you know ask about me every time you pull over I one of my friends. Everybody. Say, where's I Brooklyn, the drug dealer? Everybody. You ask my brother. He got pulled over by you, and you asked him, where's the drug dealer at? See that guy's driving my car? Yeah. I stopped him, too. Yeah, he's a black of... guy. I guess oh, so. Oh, my God. Okay. <laughs> it's either Indians or black guys, then. That's... Come on. It's like the same old shit. Like, you guys think we're up to nope. something no we're, good. We're, you know? we're in the neighborhood. We're rolling around, and we come into contact with I people. I make music now. That's well, all I'm I do. I'm glad to hear that. I change kids' lives, and I try to change my own. <laughs> and, this, you know? and I change kids', kids lives, too, right. in this neighborhood by being out here yeah. day oh, and night, making contact, making sure people are safe. So it's it's not This the is the delicate dance that Aboriginal youth and police often do on the city street. Yeah, that's continuous, man. Honestly, I'm so sick and tired of the stereotype. Everyone is sick of the stereotype. Everyone wants things to change. But how do we do that? As an Indigenous person, I have to know where I came from. And where I came from, again, less than 200 years ago, was the land. The land and the people were so interconnected. What's the core thing that the land gives them? The land gives them wholeness and completeness. Well, let's figure out a way to give them that experience. No one says you have to pack up and move out to the bush. Well, you have to have a connection, you have to interact, and you have to draw spiritual and psychological sustenance from that. And then you can go and continue on in the life that you've chosen for whatever reason in the urban environment. That connection to the land is important for many, no matter how citified. Even Jordan Tutu, the first Inuk ever to play in the NHL, Here's a steal. Jordan Tutu. needs to go back to his roots. Obviously, the game has brought me to many places where I never expected to be. Going to cities where it's just 24-hour non-stop. Uh, you know, how do people live like this?
When the hockey season ends, he leaves the big city and connects to his home community in Rankin Inlet. What, what are you in school or what? Uh, I'm starting grade one. I always know that I have people that I can count on to understand me for, you know, Jordan, the one, the kid that grew up here, not Jordan, the, the, the hockey player that is living, living the high life. Oh, you're I definitely have a connection with nature. Oh, I'm getting full of feathers. You got to respect the land. You know, you really become a humble person when you appreciate what's given to you out there. Because, you know, down south, everything's just so fast-paced. For me, we can be a native person that has a foot in the bush and a foot in the city but really um, be who we are and, and in a modern world and being contemporary and modern. Ideally, I would be very close to the land in order to practice some traditions. Given that I'm in the city, I obviously can't do that, but I still have a very close relationship with my creator, and that's something that I believe I'm able to do anywhere. <laughs> In most cities, the local Native Friendship Center has become the place to go for cultural activity. At the Friendship Center in Val d'Or, a seven-hour drive north of Montreal, a new program is proving hugely popular with non-Native parents. An Aboriginal daycare where Native and non-Native kids play and learn about Native culture together. We live in a city where uh, there's a lot of Native people. So I find it interesting that uh, at a young age they learn about each other's culture. I find it's a good way to counter uh, racism. When we opened our doors, we were hearing comments about the quality that could be not as high as a non-Native daycare because it's in a Native environment. But now we see that we have waiting lists of non-Native family of, in Val d'Or that wish to have their children integrate this daycare. Who am I? In a sense, it's the same problem that our ancestors faced when they were dispossessed and moved to the city in the first place. I used to be a hunter. Who am I now? Or what good am I now? They have to reinvent themselves, right? And some do and some don't. Many Aboriginal people have lived in the city for generations with little connection to the culture. So many of our youth don't know their past or how colonization affects their lives. The boys from Winnipeg's most want to understand their past so that they can move forward, but how do you do that? Well, they say wisdom lies with the elders. So we arranged a meeting between Winnipeg's most and elders Stella Blackbird and Audrey Bone to see what would happen. Not knowing about uh, my Aboriginal culture comes from my grandmother and my mom being in residential schooling and, and the stuff that was going on there where they were forced to be ashamed of who they were. Yeah, it's a long struggle. But then, you're well on your way. There, you're starting to think about it. Our grandfathers, our grandmothers, they were not allowed to practice their um, mm -hmm. ceremonies. They thought they took it all away from us, but you can't take away something you can't see. And that's our spiritual way of life. And we have that today. They, they couldn't take that away from us, and they never will. I know it's going to take long, you know. For people to accept us, it's like that all over. I go in the store, I'm always being watched. You know, like I'm going to put something in my purse. <laughs> today, those little things, they just bounce off me. <laughs> yeah. Brush it off. <laughs> if we're looking at things that eroded our sense of who we are, there was also something called the 60s scoop. That's where throughout the 1960s and into the 80s, 
thousands of kids were taken away from their homes and adopted out, usually to white families. As one report stated, the road to hell was paved with good intentions and the child welfare system was the contractor. I don't remember any of this. I don't remember being this age. I don't remember getting off the plane. I don't remember hardly anything. Basically, I was put in almost like a catalog so that my parents can choose which child they wanted. And I guess they thought this was a really cute picture, so they chose me. And um, off I went from, from Manitoba right over to Montreal. At the age of three, Nakuset was adopted out to a Jewish family where her name was changed. Misguided social workers thought it would be better if she didn't identify as Aboriginal. So I know that my mother used to try to tell me to tell people that I was Israeli because I'm dark, so that would sort of make a better story. You know, I was just a kid, you know, having a rough time looking the way I do and being brought up. Like, I would go out with Jewish boys, and their parents would take a look at me and go, uh-uh-uh. She's hurt. Strangely enough, she discovered her Aboriginal identity through this 1990 Academy Award-winning movie. Kind of embarrassing, but I saw the movie Dances with Wolves, and then I became a born again Indian. I was just like, wow, I'm gonna wear a braid now, I'm gonna wear a choker, and I did. Against her parents' wishes, she began to explore her Aboriginal identity. She changed her name to Nakuset, which means the sun, a spirit name given to her by an elder. She began to feel she belonged somewhere. Now she runs a shelter for Aboriginal women. So now what I need from the rest of you is what are they going to be saying? And works to bring all people together to improve lives. Because we have to work together. And also, I have a strong feeling that if we wait for the government to address our issues, that's never going to happen. And at home, she's making sure her kids know who they are and where they come from. I gave my children Aboriginal names so people will know right away that they are. Since they're babies, they've been to powwows, so they're not going to have any um, issues about whether they are or not. They'll know they are. Meet Ron Linklater. He really fusses over the new additions to his family. Hey, boys, how you doing? Here's Dipper. I take them out twice a day. I take them to their walks. <laughs> they mean a lot. He seems to live the typical suburban lifestyle. Yeah. But it wasn't always this way. I remember as a young boy growing up in the 60s and 70s, being on welfare ourselves and having to go to these uh, places in the city that gave meals out to people. Come on, baby, come on. So he's thankful for what he has today, and he acknowledges it was hard to adjust. Making friends, trying to live in a whole different environment, you know, it's, 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 it really was a struggle for me. And today I've accomplished that, I've, and, and even more, when I think back, living in a larger urban center, I'm more successful today, and I, and I know where I am part of a community today, and I try and respect other community cultures, other people that I meet in our neighborhood, for instance. Uh, get to know our neighbors, those sorts of things. For Ron, the good life isn't about enjoying the benefits of the suburbs. It's about being true to his culture and traditions. And it's about sharing his knowledge with Canadians in his day job. Here it's with future counselors at Red River College in Winnipeg. It's like they didn't know about our history yet. Growing up, you start to understand who you are as an Aboriginal man now. Once they started to realize that history or started to learn about that history, learn about that history it started to change their attitudes towards, towards the people, and for the better. So is it they were affected by residential school, or there's no way to resist that kind of life? Some of his students are new immigrants. He finds that some quickly adopt society's negative stereotypes about Aboriginal people. He loves to change their attitudes. 
before I had a negative assumption about these Aboriginal people, but because I didn't know what's going on with their life. Without the class, I perceive them negatively. But when I come to the class, now I know them. Who are they and what they are doing? It seems Ron might just have one of the solutions. Get to know your neighbors. The more you know, the better it is. It's all about education. That means raising the level of education for all Aboriginal people. Educating them in their own history so they can understand the past and begin to heal. It means educating non-Aboriginal people so that they get to know and understand us. It means bridging the divide between cultures, small steps, like here in Toronto, Winnipeg's most reaching out to mainly non-Aboriginal audiences. And it's about allowing Aboriginal culture to flourish rather than trying to kill it. It means adapting to specific needs, like this clinic in Val d'Or that respects Native cultures. In the end, it's all about changing and strengthening the relationship between us. A dialogue is created, it doesn't just happen out of the blue. A dialogue is built with time, uh, it's built with people, individuals, that believe in, in the fact that we're sharing the land. The good life is where you and I can see each other on the street, find each other interesting, establish a connection, and build a relationship from there. That's the good life.